Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Betsy Cooper. I'm the Executive Director of the Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity. Um, and it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you today to our CLTC seminar series. Uh, for those of you who don't know us, we are a innovation and collaboration hub based at the School of Information here at Berkeley, focused on the future of cybersecurity. We're interested in how technology is changing, how society, how policy, how politics, how the economy is changing over time, and what we can do to begin to think about those things now. So we do a lot of research on campus. We've actually funded 49 different projects, uh, and faculty, staff, and graduate students are all eligible to apply. Um, we're working with the School of Information and the College of Engineering to build a master's degree in cybersecurity, so stay tuned for more information on that. And we're really an engagement hub. We really like to be the place where people come to talk about tough questions. And today, we're going to be hearing about some of the toughest questions of them all in this space. So today, we are honored to welcome David E. Sanger to speak here at the Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity. Mr. Sanger is a national security correspondent for the New York Times, one of the newspaper's senior writers, and a three-time Putlitzer Prize winner. Most recently, in 2017, he was part of a team of New York Times reporters who run the 2017 Putlitzer in international reporting. He's authored two Times bestsellers on foreign policy and national security, and I hear he's working on another book now, so hopefully uh, we'll get to see that soon. And he's had a 35-year career at the New York Times, um, including serving as the White House correspondent during the Clinton and Bush administrations. Today, Mr. Sanger joins us to speak about his prolific cybersecurity reporting. He was the reporter who revealed the story of Olympic Games, the code name for Stuxnet, which is now known as the most sophisticated cyber attack in history. He's since closely covered the rapidly developing implications of cyber war on national security and international relations, delving into issues and questions that we here at the Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity ask ourselves every day. Um, we've asked David to give us some of his information and background about uh, many of the events that we've all been deeply concerned about and to help us think through how those things will affect our democracy. Uh, I'm extremely excited to honor and honored to welcome David to the stage. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, Betsy, and thank all of you for coming out here. It's always a little risky when you come to Berkeley on a pretty day, and you always think to yourself, is anybody going to come listen to this stuff when it's so gorgeous out there? So um, it's, uh, it's particularly an honor to be back uh, to talk to the uh, Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity. Um, I think the campus is incredibly lucky to have such a great project, um, and I get to be the beneficiary frequently of, of some of the wonderful work that Betsy and her team uh, put out. We're both beneficiaries of the Hewlett Foundation, which has uh, sponsored uh, some of uh, the research into some of the most difficult questions in the cyber realm. And today, I want to talk about some of the hardest ones, which is how a technology that we thought 10 or 15 years ago would be an unalloyed good for democracy somehow got hijacked in the 2016 election and made us question much of what we thought about the powers and effects of these ever greater connections that we've built over the years, thanks to the, to the internet, the World Wide Web, with voters, with ideas, and actually with the voting process itself. Now, I come to this discussion here uh, on this great campus um, with a bit of humility because I am not a scholar of any of this stuff. I'm a news correspondent. And while I co-teach a, a course at the Kennedy School at Harvard called Central Challenges in American National Security Strategy in the Press, um, the fact of the matter remains that Cyber is the newest, and to my mind, the most exciting new realm in foreign policy and national security studies because it so mixes up the game between large powers and small ones, between those who are tech savvy and those who are not, between those who see an opportunity, as the North Koreans have, for example, to um, use their small size and their isolation from the web as a defense while they actually go on the offense. And then there are countries like Russia which have used cyber in such innovative ways that we didn't see coming 
which is much of what I want to talk to you about today. Now, um, as, you, um, as you heard uh, at the beginning, I was lucky enough to be uh, part of a group of reporters uh, in Washington, Moscow, several capitals in Europe that we put together last year, long before the election came together, to try to examine the question of how Vladimir Putin was using his newfound powers. Not just cyber power, but how he was using influence all around uh, Europe, all around uh, Asia, and uh, doing so in a way that enabled him to actually leverage uh, a situation in which he has very little natural power and influence. Putin frequently complains that he does not have, and Russia does not have, the kind of influence the Soviet Union does. He has often talked about how the Soviet Union's dissolution was, in his mind, the greatest tragedy of the 20th century. We can all think of a few other tragedies of, of the 20th century. Um, and how he is determined to go bring Russia back. And cyber has been a part of that. Now, a good place to start may be with this photograph. If it's familiar to you, uh, it was on the top of our website and on the front page of the New York Times uh, when we did our first big reconstruction of the Russia hack in December of uh, last year. And I'll be coming back to this a little later on in our talk. Eric Lipton and Scott Shane and I worked for months to go reconstruct exactly what had happened, go back to each of the players once the election was over. And one of the fascinating things we discovered was that people who were unwilling to talk to us during the election because they thought they knew how it would turn out were suddenly willing to talk to us and tell a very different story once they saw how it actually did turn out. Now, while we were doing this reporting, we were at the Democratic National Committee. And we were down in the basement, and we ran across this scene. Now, on the left there, you see a battered file cabinet, so battered that it's missing the handle on the bottom drawer. And uh, I think that if this was at a uh, garage sale somewhere in Berkeley, it would probably bring about five bucks. Um, it was jimmied open by the Watergate burglars in 1972 as part of the third-rate burglary that brought down an entire presidency. To get a few file folders out of it, from which they learned almost nothing of value, uh, the Watergate plumbers had jimmied open the door and then busted that poor drawer down at the bottom. Now, on the right, next to it, sitting on that table, very slim, can barely see it, is a Dell computer server. It's circa 2016, and it's worth a little more than five bucks, but not much more than five bucks. Mm -hmm. This was the server that two Russian intelligence agencies got into starting in 2015. It's the one that had the emails that they made public via various cutouts like DC leaks, which appears now to have been set up by the GRU, the Russian uh, Military Intelligence Unit. When the leaks to this website they set up attracted insufficient attention, they somehow got this material to WikiLeaks. And for this intrusion, obviously, the Russians didn't need to jimmy open the door. They didn't even need to be in the country. And while we don't know yet if they influenced the outcome of the election or even many votes, I think it's fair to say that what we've learned in the past year tells you they probably did have greater influence on the outcome than the Watergate burglars did in 1972. Now, when you get beyond the mere fact of these two break-ins, 44 years apart, the analogy begins to falter. And I don't want to take it too far because Every day in my job at the Times, I'm reminded of the lessons of a great professor that I uh, had back at Harvard when I was an undergraduate, the late Ernie May, who authored a book that any of you who haven't read should. It's called Thinking in Time, and it describes the wonders and the pitfalls of thinking by analogy. 
something that politicians and journalists are want to do even when they shouldn't. So um, a few years ago, it's worth thinking that the cyber analogy that we would have been discussing had we all been gathered here before the Russia hack was the use of the phrase a cyber Pearl Harbor. People have been using that line since the 1990s. And what it was meant to convey was our fear of a real bolt from the blue attack that we would never see coming, that we didn't understand till it was too late, and that of course would take out all of the power from Boston to Miami or from San Francisco down to LA. Now, fortunately that hasn't happened, um, but that's only transformed the use of the analogy. So the other day I was on a panel in uh, Boston at a cybersecurity conference, and at the dinner the night before, somebody asked, was the Russia hack our cyber Pearl Harbor? We all thought about this for a while, and finally I said to her, if you had to ask, the answer is probably no. But it was still a defining moment in the use of cyber as a weapon of influence. Just as Stuxnet, as Betsy said before, was a defining moment in the use of cyber as a source of destruction. And so what I thought I'd do today for a few minutes is look back a bit about what we've learned about the different uses of cyber, offensive uses of cyber, and then take you on a bit of a deeper dive on what we know about how the Russia hack happened and then end with a few tentative lessons about what we should draw from this whole experience. And when we get to the Q&A, I'd be particularly grateful if you challenged me on some of those lessons, because I'm still thinking this through myself, and because we still don't understand the whole story. Congress was holding hearings on this issue just yesterday and today. They ended just an hour or so before we all gathered here. It was only two days ago that we discovered, thanks to the special prosecutor in the Russia case, Robert Mueller, that a young foreign policy aide in the Trump campaign, essentially a volunteer whose only real foreign policy experience on his resume was that he had been in Model UN, um, <laughs> was the conduit for a Russian offer to make use of some emails that were allegedly embarrassing to Hillary Clinton. We don't know what emails the Russians may have had in mind. The criminal complaint that we read on Monday didn't say. So what that tells you is we have not gotten to the bottom of this story yet. So where to start on this? When I try to get people to situate where we are in the world of understanding cyber as a weapon, I usually try to start with Wilbur Wright. So this was College Park in 1908. The field you see, for any of you who've been out to the University of Maryland at, at College Park, is now their soccer field. And this was Wilbur showing off his invention to a bunch of army generals who had never seen an airplane before, were trying to figure out how it might be useful to them, and knew only one thing. They didn't want it flying around the Potomac where it could actually hit something important. So the generals looked at this, and they said, gee, this is a fabulous invention. What a way for us to conduct surveillance on an enemy formation miles away, figure out where they're vulnerable, and then send the cavalry up on horseback to go attack them. <laughs> there was absolutely no imagination that in 10 years' time, the airplane might be armed and look something like this, or that in 30 years' time, it would look something like this. These are Japanese zeros, which my father, was, who's now 94, was uh, intently focused on as a fighter director on a, on a uh, destroyer out in the Pacific, or that roughly 37 years after Wilbur showed that plane off, you ended up putting an airplane like this, combining it with another new technology, 
the nuclear weapon, and we ended up like this. What that tells you is we are at such an early moment in the use of cyber as a weapon that we can't really imagine sitting here in 2017 how this may be used in 2025, much less in 2045. And two years ago, I think most of us would have been surprised to think that it could have had much influence or a role in an election. A decade ago, we were not even thinking of cyber as a potential threat. You know, every year, the intelligence community is required to come out with a public national threat assessment, unclassified national threat assessment. And in 2007, the Bush administration gave theirs, one of their last ones, to Congress. No surprise, it said terrorism remains a preeminent threat to the homeland. And after the tragic events in New York uh, yesterday, uh, I can easily imagine why people would put that as number one. But cyber attacks? In 2007, 10 years ago, they did not even make the list. You went through the entire document and did not see the word cyber. So, what's happened since that time? A few months after that threat assessment, actually a week after that threat assessment was given out, Steve Jobs introduced the iPhone. And for the past four or five years now, the number one threat in the threat assessment has been cyber attacks on the United States, which the most recent one said has soared in scale, sophistication, and severity of impact. So there you are, we went from zero to the number one slot in a decade's time. Now, General James Clapper, who was the Director of National Intelligence until the end of the Obama administration, and has been pretty interesting and outspoken in recent times about President Trump, immediately told Congress that he actually didn't really believe in the cyber Pearl Harbor thing. He said, although we must be prepared for a large Armageddon-scaled strike that would debilitate the entire US infrastructure, that's not what we believe is the most likely scenario. And instead, he went on to say that the main concerns are data manipulation, privacy issues, and so forth, and that, of course, Russia, China, and to a lesser degree, Iran and North Korea were the biggest concern. And in his later testimony, he would always make the point that we don't have a concept yet about how to deter these threats. And I'll come back to that at the end of our talk. So when states use cyber, how do they use it? Well, for espionage, and as I said, for manipulation of data, for destructive purposes, which means that you use a computer attack essentially to do via cyber what previously you could only do by bombing something or sending in saboteurs. Or, and I've started because it's the one that we'll spend the most time on today, to achieve political goals. So let's run through those really quickly. So sometimes hacking is plain old espionage. On your left, the F-35, the most expensive um, airplane you've ever paid for. Um, and each one of you has paid for several thousand dollars of that, I suspect. And on the right, the Chinese equivalent of this stealth fighter that looks remarkably like it, which has everything to do with the fact that they got into both the Pentagon and the uh, contractors and stole the designs. That would be a classic, but only a small example of how cyber has been used for espionage purposes. Now, sometimes it's for destructive purposes. And this is um, uh, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, the previous president of Iran, walking through the centrifuge hall at Natanz before Stuxnet struck. And those silvery um, devices next that he's walking through, if you've never 
been in a centrifuge hall are what are used, they're all linked together to enrich uranium. And inside each one of those silver cylinders is a very thin additional cylinder that spins at supersonic speeds. And through a, a, a centrifuge process, it basically separates out heavier and lighter elements. And that's how you take plain old uranium then turned into a gas form and you over time enrich it to something that you could use in a nuclear power plant. Or if you kept enriching, you kept those spinning, you could turn it into bomb grade uranium and use it for a weapon. And of course, that's what the United States was trying to avoid have happen in Iran. But they knew that if the US or more likely the Israelis bombed the facility, which was entirely possible to do, it's underground but not very far underground, what the result would be. And so it was that President Bush, when approached by a group of generals and intelligence uh, experts uh, in the Oval Office around 2006, 2007, approved a plan to attack this centrifuge hall with a cyber weapon, as Betsy said, the most sophisticated one that we knew of. It used four zero-day flaws. Those are flaws that had never been seen before, that the Iranians would never have seen before. They were flaws largely in the Microsoft operating system. And over time, what the program did was speed up or slow down those centrifuges moving at their supersonic speed until these things blew up. And when they blew up, they went off like giant grenades. You do not want to be in a, in a centrifuge hall when one of these things is blowing up because it's nothing but metal shrapnel. And when one blows up, it takes out the ones next to it. And the whole concept was to do this with a subtle enough effect, and we'll come back to this when we discuss the Russia hack, that the Iranians wouldn't know for certain whether they were blowing up because they had made some manufacturing error, there were ball bearings at the bottom of this that weren't working right, or whether somebody was messing with them. And it was a hard question to answer because we've blown up lots of centrifuges just out of manufacturing errors before. That was an incredibly subtle use of a cyber weapon and not the last one. Earlier this year, my colleague Bill Broad and I reported on a program that President Obama had approved late in his presidency in 2014 to do cyber attacks of a very different type against North Korea's missile program. It worked for a while, then it stopped working. But it was another interesting example of how you use cyber in a very subtle way to try to do something that if you did it from the air would probably start a war. This was the story that we ran in June of 2012 that described Olympic Games. And um, it um, won me a four year long FBI leak investigation. Uh, fortunately, that one is over, um, but gives you a sense of how sensitive these issues quickly become to the government. Now, the post-Stuxnet world has been a fascinating one because in the years since Stuxnet happened and since it was revealed that it happened, and by the way, it wasn't revealed by the New York Times. The program actually revealed itself by getting out in a way that it shouldn't have thanks to a programming error and suddenly the Iranians and everybody else in the world had a copy of the source code. But in the years since that happened, there have been a lot of state-sponsored attacks, more than I could fit on several slides here, so I just gave you a couple. The Iranians attacked oil production at Saudi Aramco. The North Koreans attacked banks and uh, media companies in South Korea, operation called Dark Soul. The State Department and the White House were attacked by the Russians. 
The Sands Casino in Las Vegas was attacked by the Iranians. Why the Sands Casino? Because it's owned by Sheldon Adelson, a very well-known uh, Republican uh, donor who sat one day uh, in front of the cameras at Yeshiva University and talked about how to solve the Iranian nuclear problem and suggested the best way to do it would be detonating a nuclear weapon in the sands of the Iranian desert, uh, glassify the desert, and tell the Iranians that Tehran was next. And he thought that would solve the problem. Before anybody uh, could take up his advice, the Iranians came by to visit the Sands Casino. And um, one day his operators walked in there one morning and discovered that their computer systems were completely melting down. And that you can't really run a casino without your computer systems. Um, there was a German steel mill that had a similar meltdown, we believe the Russians. And then of course Sony and the Office of Personnel Management, I'll come back to those. Sony was fascinating because it was a political hack. The goal here was not to steal money. It was, much like the Russia hack, in order to influence events. This was the event they were trying to influence. This is the poster for a truly terrible movie called The Interview. <laughs> and I can save two hours of your life now by suggesting that you download something else when you get home tonight. Um, the concept of the interview was that the CIA would go out and hire two journalists, you can see them there, played by Seth Rogen and James Franco, who were supposed to go assassinate Kim Jong-un. Now, I've been a journalist for a long time, and I can tell you that if you were gonna hire two people from any profession to go pull off an assassination of a political leader, I would suggest you try something else. Dentists, you know, <laughs> lawyers, I don't know. But don't try journalists, they'll screw it up, okay? Um, when the North Koreans saw that this movie was coming out, but before it came out, and they wanted to uh, try to stop it, they did the first natural thing you would do when you would want to derail Hollywood from making a movie. They wrote a letter to the Secretary General of the United Nations asking him to stop it. <laughs> because we all know that the Secretary General has such incredible influence in, in Hollywood. <laughs> when that failed, they started threatening uh, Sony. And um, the head of Sony Pictures uh, in LA was concerned enough that he called the head of the Asia Department, the Assistant Secretary for Asia at the State Department, and said, hey, I'm getting all these threats from North Korea. What do I make of this? And he said, oh, the North Koreans are always threatening something. I'd forget about it. So um, what happened? The North Koreans, using a group called the Reconnaissance General Bureau, which is run by this gentleman you see in the um, uniform, meeting Jim Clapper, uh, the DNI, when he went to North Korea to win the release of an American, uh, went inside Sony's computer systems, and they very patiently waited inside those systems, mapped out what was going on, and that was all happening while Mr. Clapper, General Clapper, was in North Korea. But he wasn't aware at the time that North Korea was inside Sony's systems. Why would he be? Sony's systems was a private one, it's not something the US government normally monitors, and it turned out that the head of the Reconnaissance General Bureau was not about to go tell him during their dinner, which was mostly occupied, uh, General Clapper tells me, by trying to relitigate the Korean War. <laughs> the other thing that happened at that dinner is that the North Koreans stuck General Clapper with the bill, even though he was visiting them. <laughs> so what happened next? Workers at Sony showed up the day after Thanksgiving. They turned on their computer screens. They saw this image where they thought they were going to see, you know, angry notes from their boss about why they hadn't gotten more work done. And um, this 
arg this whole thing, this wording in here, basically made a ransomware threat. This wasn't about ransomware. It's true that the North Koreans had stolen some vital emails about how difficult it was to work with Angelina Jolie and released these. It was of great interest to supermarket tabloids and to almost nobody else. Uh, but the real purpose of this attack was to melt down the computers at Sony. And that's what happened. And then you may all recall that there was great difficulty in distributing the movie because a lot of movie theaters were afraid in the Christmas of 2014 that, in fact, they would be um, subject to terror attacks or attacks by the North Koreans if they showed the movie. Now, events have since proved that we have a lot of other things to worry about from the North Koreans that are more serious than that. But it was a fascinating, well-executed hack by a country that you would not think was capable of launching it. And that gets to a really important point about cyber. It's attractive to countries like North Korea because it's dirt cheap, fairly easy to execute, and nobody's going to turn around and do a cyber attack back at North Korea because I can guarantee you there are more IP addresses on this block of Berkeley than there are in all of North Korea. So it was a really fascinating short of war attack. This is a scene from the movie, another reason you could miss it. But what's interesting about this is somebody actually had to go brief the President of the United States about the Sony attack. I got to the briefer. The briefer said to President Obama, I never thought I'd be here briefing on a bad Seth Rogen movie, sir. The President said, how do you know it's a bad movie? He said, sir, it's a Seth Rogen movie. <laughs> but the day before President Obama left for a Hawaii vacation, he came down in the press room, and it was the only time we have ever seen the President of the United States come out and tell the press that there had been a cyber attack on the United States, and here's who did it. And we're coming after them. And the argument that he made was actually, as you would expect from a constitutional lawyer, a First Amendment argument. We cannot have a society in which some dictator someplace can start imposing censorship here in the United States, even if it's to stop a really bad movie. Okay? And... The U.S. did some minor things to the North Koreans, some sanctions that I doubt the North Koreans ever felt, given all the other sanctions that are on them, and maybe or maybe not cut off their access to the Internet for a couple of days through China. At the same time, while Sony was happening, there was another extraordinary espionage attack, also very subtle, this time from the Chinese, and it was to steal the kind of data that OPM, the Office of Personnel Management, the most boring bureaucracy in Washington, gathers on everybody who's getting a security clearance. This is more than just stealing your social security number. This is much more than what Equifax would have. It's your health records. It's your marriage records. It's records about your kids. It's records about anybody you dated before you got married. It's records about your bankruptcies. It's everything you would need to draw a picture of what somebody was like. How did OPM respond to this? Well, first of all, they left this data unencrypted, which tells you how out of it they must have been. Mm -hmm. Secondly, they were storing it, because Congress wants them to store it in the least, least expensive way possible, on the computer systems of the Interior Department where this vital information was given the same protection that we give to, say, bison uh, migration in Yellowstone, okay? Um, in the end, no senior official in the United States talked publicly about this breach, even though it was the biggest breach of American government records that we can find, and one that will be used for political purposes for many years to come. Was this a cyber attack? Not if you ask the National Security Agency or the CIA. Why not? Because it was espionage. And we all agree that they do espionage to us and we do espionage to them. And therefore, if we call it a cyber attack and begin to develop a norm that we won't 
do this kind of thing, then the US government's gonna have to stop doing something that we employ tens of thousands of people to go do each day. And that issue will also come back in the Russia hack. Now, why did I run you through all of these? It's because this was the context in which the Russia hack happened. This was a world in which cyber became used in more and more subtle methods every month and every year. This was a world in which, while we still worry about a cyber Pearl Harbor, we discovered cyber weapons could be tailored to much, much more subtle purposes. So, let's talk for a moment about what happened in the Russia hack. What made this so interesting? Well, as we reconstructed the story, what we discovered, first of all, was that the United States government was not the first to discover the Russians were in our system. A foreign government had actually detected that the Russians had records from the Democratic National Committee. And being good allies, notified the NSA. The NSA is not allowed to operate inside the United States for all kinds of good legal reasons. They're a foreign intelligence collection agency. So they took the data, neatly laundered it so they took out the sources and methods, and handed it off to the FBI to go investigate. And this got handed to an overworked FBI agent in the Washington field office. If you're wondering where the Washington field office is, you saw pictures of it the other day as Paul Manafort was surrendering with his lawyer on Monday morning. That was the Washington field office. And some poor guy in there gets 150 different cases. He's completely overwhelmed. And so he calls over to the Democratic National Committee, not especially aware of its sensitive political history given Watergate. And he wants to be able to talk to somebody about cybersecurity there. So he does what any of us would do. He calls the help desk and gets put on hold. <laughs> Eventually, he is put in contact with a 20-something cyber, uh, uh, I'm sorry, information technology uh, a person who keeps the DNC's computers running but doesn't know very much about cybersecurity. What's worse, he actually didn't believe that he was talking to a real special agent from the FBI. So he basically ignored him. And they ended up trading phone calls, I kid you not, back and forth for nine months. During which time the Russians got into the DNC emails, John Podesta's Gmail account. You read those emails later on. The DCCC, the Democratic Congressional Committee. Emails. They were doing all of this while these two people were trying to figure out how to get together. Now, it is possible that the FBI agent could have walked out of the FBI building and walked to the DNC and tried to get somebody's attention. I did it myself. It takes 12 minutes, and I stopped at Starbucks to get a coffee on the way. Okay? So this was not exactly a hard, remote case he was trying to go take up. Come April or May of 2016, the DNC recognized that they were beginning to lose a lot of data. They had the slow dawning recognition the way the people at OPM did about a year after the Chinese started cleaning them out. And they called in a private security firm, cybersecurity firm, which went in, took a look at this, and basically came to the conclusion that they had lost all of their emails out there and issued a report in mid-June that identified two different groups that were different competing Russian security services. There wasn't much of a reaction to this. We wrote a story in the New York Times. It was like at the bottom of D16, I think, okay? Um, 
The President of the United States was not briefed on this until June of 2016, or nine months after the NSA tip was passed on to the FBI. In the time period between the time that the US intelligence agencies became aware of this and the time it made it to the presidential daily brief, there were babies who were conceived and born in the United States. Okay. If you are thinking that one of the keys to long-term cybersecurity, as Betsy would tell you, is rapid response, we kind of failed at it. And then, as the summer rolled out, we began to see these emails published. You may remember some of them came out just before the Democratic National Convention and resulted in the resignation of Debbie Wasserman Schultz, who was the chairman of the convention. Then there were other emails that came out, John Podesta's in October, uh, a few hours after the release of that um, rather rude tape in which um, then-candidate Trump was discussing his deep respect for women. Um, <laughs> And during all this time, we were trying to get the Clinton campaign to let us at their cyber people so that we could understand completely what had happened. They've rewritten history on this a little bit now, but they wouldn't let us anywhere near them. Why wouldn't they let us anywhere near them? Because they were quite concerned that anything that had to do with cyber and emails would eventually be turned around to a discussion of Hillary's emails in that server in Chappaqua. And so they just didn't want the subject discussed. That changed later on. Now what happened at the White House? There was a big debate underway. How do you respond to this? Do you publicly out the Russians? Do you do something of a cyber nature back to the Russians? Do you do something of an information nature back to them? Some people said, well, why don't we just go reveal uh, that um, President Putin has hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars in uh, foreign bank accounts, maybe freeze those accounts, maybe reveal his connections to the oligarchs. Others said, this is really going to work? Big news flash to the Russians? Vladimir Putin is linked to the oligarchs? <laughs> So in the end, they were extremely cautious and did not name the Russians. In July, with a colleague of mine, Eric Schmidt, we wrote a story saying US intelligence has determined with uh, basically the highest level of certainty that they rank intelligence on, that it was the Russians who were behind the hack. But still the intelligence agencies said nothing. They said nothing until October 7th when they turned out a statement on just that issue. And even then, they didn't link it directly to Putin, something they did months later, once they said they had more evidence. An interesting question as we think about the lessons of all of this is whether President Obama underreacted. Underreacted by not naming the Russians when they got into the State Department email system years before? when they got into the White House system, when they got into the Joint Chiefs of Staff system, and not doing so when they got into the DNC. That was strongly defended, that set of decisions, by people around President Obama till the very last day he served in office. Today, now that they've had a little time to reflect and be out of office, many of them are not quite so certain they handled it the way they wanted to. And then we discovered, after we had done this reporting, that there was a lot of advertising and a lot of uh, Facebook, Twitter, and Google posts that turned out to have been put together by the Internet Research Agency in Russia, which is another propaganda arm. Nothing new here. Stalin used to turn out fake news all the time in the 40s. But when you can use Facebook, you can really broadcast it much more broadly. 
And just in the past few days, we've gotten actual numbers, finally, from those companies about how broadly it was. And it was a lot bigger than they thought. Facebook and the other firms would not reveal what those ads were, even though we had all seen them, or some of us had seen them, in our feeds at the time. Well, fortunately, this morning, Congress decided to reveal them for them. They turned out 3,000 of the ads. I've not had a chance to go through all of them, but when I got off the airplane today, I downloaded just three so that we would have examples to give you guys a sense of what the Russians were doing. And what you discovered was that they weren't really specific, that specific to President Trump, uh, then candidate Trump or Secretary Clinton, but instead they were designed to pick up divisive issues within our own society and divide us even more. Again, a very, very subtle use of cyber. Here was one of them. Another gruesome attack on police by a BLM, Black Lives Matter, movement activist. Our, heart are, our, our hearts are with those 11 heroes. And it's showing you a, a funeral. And this was um, uh, about a gun battle in East Boston where it's not at all clear that it had anything to do with Black Lives Matter. Here's one of my favorite from the Army of Jesus. Turns out that was a Russian-created group. Um, Satan, if I win, Clinton wins. Jesus, not if I can help it. Press like to help Jesus win. Now, I'm not quite sure who thinks this stuff up, okay? But it is interesting that this was one of those ads that made their way out and around. Heart of Texas, get ready to secede. Now, my family's all from Texas, from the 1840s and 50s, and there was a period of time, as you remember, when Texas was not part of the Union, and that's taught in the Texas schools, but this was getting right at it because, of course, the argument, as you can see from the picture there, is that um, they're being taken over by Islamic forces. Fellow Texans, it's time to say a strong no to the establishment robbers, it's unacceptable for them, for us to see them ruin what we've been building for decades. Again, this is all designed to fit into existing kinds of, of disputes. So, as we think about this story, what are the lessons from it? Let me give you a few that have come to mind for me. Uh, the first, as I said, is we have to recognize we're still figuring out the facts. And... Um, back to the dangers of analogy. In the case of Watergate, we had a president who was conspiring to participate in the break-in. We have no evidence that President Trump was involved in the conception, the distribution, any collusion about these ads. Of course, on Monday we learned for the first time that a member of his campaign, a young member of his campaign, he went out, of his president went out of his way yesterday to tell us how disconnected from the campaign this youngster was, even though he was sitting at a table with the president at one point, um, uh, that uh, we learned that, in fact, there was some offer from the Russians back and forth, but we don't know how deep and important that was. Second, while we certainly have a cyber problem here, first and foremost, we have a Russia problem. As Mike McFall, our former American ambassador to Russia, who's now down the road at Stanford, said to me recently, Putin thinks that this is a zero-sum game. And for him, this is about undermining an American-led order whose existence he finds threatening. So we often forget that in Putin's mind, the original election manipulator here was Hillary Clinton when she was Secretary of State and turned out statements denouncing the 2011 parliamentary votes in Russia, which she said were not a free and fair vote. And he regards this as work to manipulate the election because her statements were followed by street protests. And it turns out Vladimir Putin doesn't like street protests. We view this very differently. We don't view that as election manipulation. We view that as standing up for good American values of self-determination. And so it's important to remember 
that election manipulation is in not only the mind of the beholder, but the mind of the recipient of the attack. Third, in our desire to prevent a repeat of the 2016 fiasco, I think it's important that we try to remember what we're trying to protect, which is free political debate, not only at home, but around the world. So there's a perfectly legitimate argument to be made about whether or not the rules that we use on television or radio about political advertisements should extend to social media. If Betsy here was running for Congress, maybe one day we'll convince her to do that, she'd have to end her television ads with the words, I'm Betsy Cooper and I approve this message. But if you run that on Facebook, you don't have to have that message in there. It's not clear why we would exempt Facebook simply because the ad was, on was running on that medium instead of on TV. And that may well be where some of this comes out. But remember, much of what we found objectionable didn't come from advertising. It was just in posts. And frankly, if an American had posted them, even if they had posted something like this, or like the Satan and Jesus uh, picture, it would be protected political speech. Even if a Russian posted them, if we really knew it was a real Russian that was there thinking, you would think that would be protected speech and we would want to make the point to the Russians that dissent's got to be allowed on Facebook. Now, that means that the problem isn't simply what's in the ads or in the posts. The problem is if they are being posted by a foreign intelligence agency that is attempting to influence an American election. So this is a lot more complicated than just regulating speech. It's regulating to some degree who's speaking. And it's made all the worse by the fact that a lot of these ended up being posted by bots. And bots don't have, even in the United States, First Amendment protection. Or at least they have not been ruled to have them that way. OK. Um, a fourth issue, and this is a subject I spend a lot of time thinking about, and it's a lot of what's in the book I'm working on, is we have to spend a lot more time thinking about deterrence. Mike Rogers, the head of the National Security Agency, said to me when he came into his job in an interview one day, you know, I'm determined to do one thing, to raise the price of doing cyber attacks on the United States. He's leaving his job sometime next year. I'm not sure that I could say right now with a straight face that we have significantly raised the price of doing cyber attacks in the United States for all the reasons we've just run through. And the interesting question is, how do you do that? We're not going to bomb a country because they ran Facebook ads. We're not going to ban them from doing espionage because we want to do espionage. We may be upset when they melt down the computers at Sony or in Las Vegas. But we have to remember that for what we view as legitimate national security concerns, we have done the same thing. And so we have to be able to explain why it is that we use cyber as a weapon as well. We're not going to be able to explain that if we continue to wrap cyber in the degree of secrecy we have wrapped it in so far. After I wrote what I wrote about Olympic Games, there were people in the US government who said, let's just go with it and make the point that if you mess with the United States, this can happen to you. Others overruled that and said, we can never discuss our cyber capabilities. Well, we figured out how to discuss our drone capabilities. We figured out how to have a debate about how to use nuclear weapons after Hiroshima and Nagasaki made clear what our nuclear capabilities were. It's not evident to me why we can't have an open debate about how we want to use cyber as well. A last point, 
on this. We have to get away from the thought that we're going to deter cyber the same way we deterred the use of nuclear weapons. All the questions are the same, all the answers are different in cyber deterrence. You knew where the nuclear weapons were coming from in the depths of the Cold War with the Soviet Union. You could go into a big bunker in Colorado Springs and see a map and see exactly where the missiles were launched from. You can't do that in cyber. It takes a long time to get to attribution. You may never have 100% certainty. You probably will never have 100% certainty. And thus, it really mixes up the question of how you would argue to retaliate. You have to think differently. You have to think about deterrence by resilience. In other words, why attack us if it's not going to work? Or deterrence by entanglement, that you're so wrapped up in the American economy, something else in the United States, that it's simply not worth it. It's why the Chinese would never bring down the American banking system. They need to be able to get into the American banks for their own economic purposes. A final thought here. If there's a big lesson from the Russia hack, it's this. We need some rules of the road, and we need them fast. I could imagine a rule that said all countries will forswear interference with each other's electoral systems. That probably means the voting systems and the registration systems more than it means the kind of ads that we've seen here. But it would be a start. The big lesson is a foreign power has figured out how to use cyber techniques not to bring us to our knees in some kind of cyber Pearl Harbor, but to make us question the legitimacy of our own democratic debate. That won't be our only cyber challenge. It may not even be our worst one. But if we don't get a handle on this now, we're in for a new kind of arms race and one that we may not be prepared to win. So I thank you for uh, having me here. I'm delighted to take your questions and uh, appreciate your uh, coming out here this afternoon to have this discussion. So I think we've got some microphones that are going around here. Well, do you guys have, there's a hand right down here. A hand right there. Why don't we start there and we'll come to you in a minute, sir. Hello. Thank you for uh, sharing your information with us. There seems uh, to be a steady supply of uh, of verifiable but unidentifiable sources of news about what's happening in the government and the administration. Uh, that seems to be unusual, uh, and they seem to be pretty reliable, and uh, you get it right first before the information comes out. Is that unusual, and how is that happening uh, without revealing your sources? You're talking about why there are so many leaks out of this administration? Well, first of all, um, the Trump administration did not invent leaking, okay? Um, that's been around for a long time. And um, President Trump is not the first president to complain about leaks. Um, during uh, the Civil War, uh, when there were both leaks and critiques of the activities of a number of uh, generals, uh, one of them, with whom New York Times and other reporters were traveling, had a simple solution that he'd um, simply throw in the brig any reporters who were revealing what was going on out in the battlefield, particularly if it reflected badly on the commander. I made the mistake once of mentioning this to General Petraeus during the Iraq War, and he looked at me with that big <laughs> smile and said, geez, why didn't we think about this? Um, but the fact of the matter is that at the beginning of the Trump administration, it was much leakier than most administrations are at the start. Usually, there are fewer leaks at the beginning of an administration because everybody who comes into an administration thinks the president is you know, 
uh, figured all of this out. They're deeply loyal from the campaign. And it's not until later on when the first crew sort of runs out of gas and they bring in a second number of people to sort of run things that you begin to hear a lot more leaking. In this administration, you had a lot of infighting from the start. You had a Steve Bannon wing, you had others. I mean, think how many people have left this administration just in the first nine months. Um, it was pretty chaotic over there. And frequently, people were leaking documents and information um, simply as a warning to others in the cabinet that some executive order was about to come down. That's not happening as much anymore. For example, none of us knew about this young uh, foreign policy aide, uh, George Papan, I think Papanopoulos is his name. Uh, we knew that he existed, but we didn't know that he had been arrested or was um, uh, under suspicion here until that all got revealed uh, by the courts just on Monday. Um, the key, I think, for our reporting is to stick very closely to the facts, not be seen as part of the resistance. That's not what the role of the New York Times or other journalistic organizations uh, are. But instead, to go out and try to nail down exactly what happened. And for all that you have heard about fake news from the president in all of those tweets, I would say if you lined up the reporting on the Russia hack and other related issues by the New York Times, the Washington Post, some others, got a pretty good accuracy record right now. See, there was a hand right down here. Okay. Thank you. Uh, you raised this question, did Obama underreact? And I was wondering if we could turn it back to you. Uh, do you think he underreacted? And in hindsight, uh, would, uh, what, what should have Obama done? What, and did he underreact because of the optics of Republicans accusing him to use government agencies to side with Clinton instead of Trump? Or did, was he concerned that we do the same thing as the Russians? I think you talked a little bit about that. And, and, and do we do the same thing as the Russians or similar things? So I think the president had two big concerns. The first was the concern that anything that they did to accuse the Russians of this would be denounced by the Republicans in Congress as a clear effort to try to side with Hillary. And that was discussed, and I think that um, a number of the president's aides who had gone up to talk to the House and Senate leadership were kind of shocked to discover how uninterested in the subject they were and that this something that they thought would be relatively bipartisan had become a partisan issue. But secondly, I think the president was worried about escalation, that if he accused the Russians of this prior to election day, that they would turn around and actually go try to manipulate the vote on election day. Now, we had greater protections against a manipulation of the vote than we knew. Our voting system, God bless it, is so backwards, so discombobulated, so different from state to state that it's actually pretty hard to hack. And one of the things that I think we have to all think about as we think about the lessons from this whole experience is keeping it discombobulated and uh, separated and offline, or at least keep the voting machines offline, and also making sure that we have a paper backup for every vote cast. But the president was deeply concerned about that. And you'll notice that he didn't order up a full um, intelligence report until after the election was over. And maybe they just thought that Hillary Clinton would win and, you know, this would have been an ugly chapter, but it wasn't going to make that big a difference. Um, we've had one other problem since then. You could have imagined a situation in which the new president would come in and say, look, I was legitimately elected, but we can't have a foreign power messing around in our elections. And so I'm gathering together a commission 
You go find somebody like Lee Hamilton, who always goes and runs commissions like this. You put them in charge. You say, we want the report back by the end of the year. And we want solutions uh, for this before the 2018, and certainly before the 2020 election. Instead, he put together a commission on what happened to the 3 million votes that must have been cast by illegals or something uh, for Secretary Clinton instead of for uh, President Trump. So that commission is looking at an issue that is completely separate from the one we've been discussing today. And I think that's problematic because obviously, as we've learned this week, there are still a lot of facts to be understood here and a lot of real recommendations to come up with. And while I think that the special prosecutor, uh, Robert Mueller, is going to work hard on the investigation, he clearly already is, it's not in his purview to then come out and say, here are the five or six things we need to go do to fix the system. And that's what requires a commission to be able to go do that. Oh, I didn't answer the last part of your question. Do we do things like this? We do a lot of cyber things for a lot of countries. We have run information operations in the past in Latin America and Iran and so forth. Um, it's not something we're very good at. And it's not something that I have much evidence we've done in recent times. Well, Voice of America is a state-run news organization, and if you want to say that that is propaganda, you can, but then you've got to say BBC is as well, which also broadcasts around the world. You know, and I, I listen to Voice of America. I occasionally go on it. They're pretty straight, and uh, they're also at times fairly critical of the U.S. government. Uh, but all countries have that, and all, all countries regard the other countries' version of it as propaganda. We certainly regard RT. It used to be Russia Today that way. But um, I think I'm, I was discussing something that would be sort of deeper, which would be you know, spreading around rumors and dirt about a candidate you didn't want to see win. Ma'am. Mike's coming right to you there. Thank you. I really appreciate you being here today, um, given this particular week. I just finished reading a wonderful report by the National Democratic Institute, and in uh, 2013, it was their um, Citizen Participation in Technology Report. Mm -hmm. And I enjoyed it immensely, but it noted just how deeply we were involved in elections in countries around the world, and blend bringing in and blending new technologies to help people um, develop you know, political coalitions and information using things such as Facebook and whatnot. Um, but as I finished it, I was considering how um, countries must have felt quite blindsided in many ways to have such a strong surge of democratic tools and techniques coming from um, the United States, and particularly from maybe um, people who've been in power in those countries. So I, I, I guess my question is in terms of cybersecurity, because you're talking about a very different type of direct attack into our um, technology and, and our government um, factors. but. Do you think this could be part of a backlash, in a sense, of just seeing how strong we've been in terms of influencing countries and their democratic election procedures? Well, certainly, as I mentioned in the talk, uh, Putin felt that way strongly based on what Secretary Clinton said. Um, I'm sure there's resentment around the world. I know there is about the fact that most of these platforms were developed you know, within 40 miles of where you're sitting today. Um, and so they view these as uniquely American uh, inventions. And remarkably, the companies are going out of their way to try to view themselves as non-American companies because their major markets are around the world. So that tension is going to exist for a long time. But the concept that Facebook and others had early on that you would connect more people and more information and get around governments in order to do so certainly is deeply threatening to the Chinese who don't let Facebook into the country. 
although most Chinese kids have figured out how to get on it, right? And to the Russians and to others, and that's one of the reasons we're so worried about the balkanization of the internet, where suddenly national boundaries are going to count for a lot again, just at a time that we thought this was a great unifying technology. Let's see here, right over here. It, it's been revealed that Russian hackers went, uh, at least attempted to get into more than 20 state electrical systems. As much as you say, you know, we've got such a backward system that uh, fortunately protected us, we're only a year away from 2018 elections. Uh, how confident are you that there's not going to be so much going on in the next year that it's going to challenge the, the legitimacy of 2018 state and local elections, electing senators, uh, representatives? let alone local people. You, know, you seem somewhat confident because we're so backward, yet yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how confident you really are. Sure. Um, very good question. And we ran a story the other day about how stressed many of the states are because they don't have the money to go put in to go reform these systems. And for a lot of states, it's a very hard case to make that you're going to spend tens of millions of dollars on a system that you use one day a year when you've got so many other things that are you know, out there. So what worries me and what doesn't? On the voting machines themselves, I'd feel a whole lot better if there was a nationwide requirement for paper backup, because even if you had something that you suspected might be fraudulent, um, you would then have a way of verifying the vote, even if it took a few weeks to go do it. It could take a while to sort out, but you'd be able to go do it. That's on the voting machines. They are not, by and large, connected to the internet, which means that somebody would have to go around to each precinct in each area to influence. It could happen, but it's hard. What does worry me is the registration systems, because they are outward facing. They want to make it easy for you to go register. You know, sometimes when you go reapply for your driver's license, or you do some other event with your town or state, you're put in to go register. And so there, there's a portal in to which hackers can get in. And when you mentioned those 20 states, it was mostly the registration systems that were being probed. We've only found two where hackers got in and actually were trying to mess around in a serious way. That's Arizona and Illinois, but they tried in many more. <coughs> and so the registration systems are a serious problem because you could imagine a situation in which masses of people show up to vote and the clerk who's sitting there to go check you off says, but you moved to Chicago last week and it turns out you didn't and you could trigger a lot of chaos that way. And so I think that's an area where we need to go focus a lot of attention early on. There's a third thing that is worth remembering. Just six months ago, because of what happened here, we were deeply worried about what would happen when the Russians messed around in the French election and in the German election? And those two have happened now. And while we don't fully understand what occurred or didn't, it doesn't look like there was that much manipulation. And that was in part because they were ready for it. They had seen what happened to us. When people saw ads like these ads that we just put up before, they suspected that someone was behind them. And so what does that tell you? It tells you that one of the greatest antidotes to all of this is actually good, solid voter education about what somebody may be doing. And that applies really more to the kind of propaganda that we were just discussing than it does to the voting system itself. Uh, last two questions. Thank you for the talk. It was really interesting. Um, you spoke about attribution um, and the difficulty of attribution. And uh, you know, I was thinking about how there are obviously state-sponsored attacks, but then you also have political hackers, um, you know, people who aren't working for the government but are doing it within their own time and uh, they have their own ideologies and beliefs. And they don't have the backing of the state, yet they attack America. Uh, in American systems. And I suspect that American uh, hackers aren't mobilized by the same agenda because America's viewed as a hegemon 
And so it's easier for, to mobilize people against America as opposed to Americans mobilizing against another state. And so I wonder whether the American government, the institution, the bureaucracy is preparing to create um, a pipeline to get uh, its own hacking systems and personnel up to speed to be able to combat this really complex threat. And if you have any information on that. So attribution is hard generally. And then even if you know that it's coming from Russia or North Korea or whatever, you're not likely to figure out for a while whether it's coming from the government, from patriotic hackers, from individuals. And then, of course, there's always a lot of criminal activity. And then there's you know teenagers. This is why this is an arms control system that's not going to work by treaty. I don't know about in your household, but in my household, the teenagers do not sign treaties. Um, so um, the result of this is that you need to have a pretty subtle system, and you can't immediately leap to the conclusion that everything is government organized. And when we have gone to the Chinese, for example, and said, we have to stop this situation in which intellectual property is being stolen by... PLA-related hackers who are then giving it to your state companies, the Chinese say, oh, you know, it's not us. It's not directed by the state. Kids nowadays, what are you going to do with them, right? Uh, and it's a great way to sort of deflect the conversation. Um, we do need to be a lot more subtle in how we do this. And part of the difficulty is that the responsibility for this is spread all around in the U.S. government. You know, the um, NSA and Cyber Command have responsibility for protecting federal networks, but not the state election systems. The Department of Homeland Security did not have state election systems listed as critical infrastructure. Monuments were, right? DHS had, you know, the, all the computers sitting inside the Lincoln Memorial, the Washington Memorial, Critical infrastructure. The fundamentals of our democracy? No. So um, there's a big question about who's responsible for it, and then how specific can you be? And then when you see these hacks that are coming across using Facebook and Twitter and so forth, our, actually our biggest line of defense has been the terms of service that they have. Not anything we could go do, but that Facebook could throw them off because they violated their terms of service rather than violating some American law. So we've got a lot of sorting out to do, both legally and logistically, about how we're going to get at this problem, even if you could do perfect attribution, and you never will be able to make that perfect. We had time for one more. Who was that young woman right there in the striped shirt? Yeah. Hi, thank you. Um, Thinking back to the election, I think of how Russia played a role, both in terms of the hacking um, and also the uh, Trump campaign um, kind of pushing or supporting policies that many people viewed as uh, pro-Russia. Um, and I think some people view all of that as like one solid, like one issue. They're all interrelated. And I was wondering if you view it that way, especially with the um, what came out about um, Manafort and the campaign manager, if you kind of see the Russia hack and also um, att attempts to encourage the Trump campaign to push pro-Russia policies as as one issue that we can view all together if those are two distinct um, issues. I, th I think they could well be distinct. Um, remember, when you go back over the U.S. intelligence reports about what the Russian motives were, they evolved over time. So if you believe their analysis, and I'm not necessarily saying I sign on to it, although I, I find it fairly compelling, the first effort was simply to cause chaos in the system and undercut our own willingness to believe in the veracity of the system. And I believe that for when you think about the timeline here, the first intrusions into the DNC by the Russians we're in the summer of 2015. Well, that's when Donald Trump was coming down the escalator at Trump Tower, and everybody was sitting around saying, oh, he'll be in the race for like a month. 
right? And then leave. So I don't think the Russians had any more of an idea than any of the rest of us did that he would ultimately win. Then it was fairly clear that Hillary Clinton would get the nomination. And if you, again, if you believe the intelligence reports, they then concluded that they could help denigrate Hillary Clinton. I think the Russians thought she would win, and anything they could do to cast doubt about the legitimacy of the vote would undercut her powers. And then it was only at the very end, you know, after the Republican convention or around that time, that the Russians came to the same conclusion that everybody else did, which was, wow, this guy could win. And at that moment, you do see a bit of a change of tone in which they were out to actually support Donald Trump. But that was toward the very end. How much is this, this is related to the fact that President Trump has never had a nasty word to say about Putin or the Russians in the course of this? I don't know. It is an odd set of policy prescriptions because it's at odds with his own party, which is has usually been quite um, skeptical of Russian motives. And so that gets to the question, was there something else going on there? And none of us have found that yet. And it may not be there. On that note, we're going to have to call it quits here. I want to thank our team, Denise, Kristen, Chuck, Caitlin, and Jobel for doing an awesome job putting this all together. I want to thank the School of Information as well as Citrus for hosting us today. Uh, we invite you all to join us for a reception to celebrate this great talk uh, just next door. And so most of all, I want to thank David. Thank you so much. This is the busiest day you could have ever possibly had, and we're so glad you brought this conversation to Berkeley. Thank you. So thank you.